Mm-hmm. <clears throat> If you guys are on Zoom, I'm just getting Facebook up and running. We're having a little bit of a technical difficulty here. So I'm going to get this thing up and popping, and then we'll begin our course tonight. Air starting broadcast. <clears throat> All right, so I think we're up on Facebook Live now. I want to welcome everybody here. Let me get Instagram up and running. 
All right, cool. So guys, we are on Friday night wealth creation course. I want to welcome everybody. Thank you for watching. Thank you for tuning in. If you're just now joining us this evening, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Um, I want to talk today about the recession. Okay. And, and for those of you that are watching this for the first time, I come to you live every Friday night with these courses uh, to spread financial education. Okay. Because I didn't have financial education. Most of us aren't given a true financial education. And, and a lot of us that are, we think it's education. It's really not. Okay, it's not what wealthy people are doing. It's what our friends and family are doing, and they're not any better off than we are, right? So it's time that, that we really start focusing on um, advice and education that really does get wealth built. Like it helps us with what we're trying to do in, in wealth building. And it's not something that, you know, everybody else is probably doing. A lot of the stuff I teach rubs people the wrong way. The average person's like, hey, that sounds crazy. Why would I do that? But the thing is this, I grew up not knowing about money. Okay, so I'm going to talk tonight about a recession. I grew up in a recession. Our family household was a recession every single day of my life growing up. Okay, we didn't have like the tech bubble 2000, you know, one, 2002, I was a little kid. We didn't have that affect us because we weren't even in a position where it would, right? Like that's, that's the type of household I grew up in. And so I want to share with you like what a recession is. I'm going to go over some basics and some simplicities for you, but more importantly, what to do. Right. So just to do a really quick recap, last week I talked about what's actually going on with the stimulus money and this bailout money. If you're not familiar with what that is, the, the federal government, which is broke, by the way, is borrowing money to loan it to the other broke people that live in this country and run businesses to keep them afloat. So it's, it's a broke group of people trying to keep another group, broke group of people afloat. Not a good thing. Right. And so that's the basic of what's happening. And so when you look at that, if our government's broke, what we talked about last week is where are they getting the money from? Okay, where are they getting this, this stimulus money, this $2 trillion that they're bailing everyone out with? Where's that coming from? Because it's not coming from taxation, right? Because our taxation, our income from the country, we looked at last week, doesn't even cover our basic expenses. We're operating on a budget deficit, meaning we're negative. And so when they're getting this money, they're borrowing it and they're borrowing it from banks. And so what's happening is we're being indebted to banks and these banks are collecting interest on us. Who's, who's heard of a treasury bill? Has anyone watching heard of a treasury bill? If you have in the comments, I wanna see some likes. If you haven't, I'm about to break this down for you. So a treasury bill, I wanna draw this out again, actually. Uh, a treasury bill is, let's get our whiteboard. You guys are around on Instagram too. Okay, so check this out. For those of you on Instagram, let's 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 get the view here for you. That should be okay. So a treasury bill, check this out. This is how it works. Basically, you have the United States government. So we're gonna put them in the middle. US Gov. And they need money, right? So we talked about last week, they borrow money from the Federal Reserve Bank, which is neither federal nor reserve nor bank, okay? But they need money. So the United States government borrows money from the Federal Reserve Bank. They're exchanging money for interest. That's the exchange here, okay? Now the US government gets money though that it can push into the economy, right? So the economy, that's us. That's us as, as individual citizens, right? So the money goes into the economy. Now. We see the benefit of that from the standpoint of, all right, things went up, uh, you know, the market recovered, housing recovered, uh, you know, the jobs are coming back, things feel better now. That's what we're looking for is the economy to go up. The problem is, is that the U.S. government now owes interest to this bank. All right. Now, I'm not okay with this because the U.S. government doesn't have a product or a service. The only way they get money to pay this interest is taxes. Federal tax. That's how this, this bill gets footed. That's what's going to pay the interest. That comes from us, right? We're the method being, <clears throat> being used to pay off this debt. <clears throat> so when this debt is borrowed, U.S. government borrows money from the bank. This debt is called a U.S. Treasury bill. A U.S. Treasury bill, a U.S. Treasury note, whatever you want to refer to it as. It's debt that the government owes, and that debt is actually looked at as an investment. 
All right. Now, up until about now, the U.S. Treasury has been considered the safest debt on earth. It's backed by the United States government, right? And the reason why it's the safest debt on earth is it's backed by income tax. A country would buy a U.S. Treasury or an investor would buy a U.S. Treasury because a treasury is a guaranteed stream of future taxation. The interest on this note represents tax money. And these banks that are buying these treasuries, they know that taxes are never going to go away. They're only ever going to go up. And so they're betting on, hey, I want, I want a piece of the tax revenue that comes into the United States of America because the citizens there in the economy have to pay that tax money. And we know that we'll get paid on our debt. Right. So we've had like a, a treasury yield, meaning the, the amount of return it generates being paid to a bank. Now, up until recently, up until recently, treasury notes have been considered a good investment. Oh, did it? OK, hang on, guys. Facebook just went down. Let me pull it back up here. Just a second. Video has ended. All right, let me start another one up. Give it a two star. Stream ended. All right, let me flip this back around, guys. All right, so Facebook just went down. Let me get it back up and running for us. having some tech issues today. All right, let's try this again. We're gonna go live on Facebook another time. <clears throat> go on my timeline. You guys are on Instagram. Thank you guys for hanging out. I appreciate it. I'm gonna jump back into this just as soon as we get Facebook back up and running. All right, we're gonna go title this because I don't know if they put it down because of what we're talking about or if it's just a tech issue. All right, just thinking about it. <clears throat> so those of you that are on Instagram really quick, I want to go ahead and, and keep this going while we're waiting for Facebook to get back up and live. Um, so these treasury notes that I was talking about, when the United States government borrows money from these banks, these banks want treasury notes because the treasury notes are guaranteed future streams of taxation. All right. So basically that means that the governments that buy these notes, investors that buy these treasury notes, they know they're going to get their money back through taxes because taxes will never go away. Now, the problem is, is up until recently, uh, still not pulling up, up until recently, treasury notes have had a positive yield, meaning that they were profitable. They paid money. If I bought a treasury note as an investor or if I bought a treasury note as a central bank, um, it had a positive yield. I, I was going to make some money on it. And I knew that, right? Now, recently, treasury notes have had a negative yield. Interesting, right? What does a negative yield mean? A negative yield means that if I buy a United States treasury, it actually costs me money. Okay, it doesn't make me money, it costs me money. So we're on a United States dollar backed monetary system internationally, globally, and that's been based on the fact that these treasuries are profitable things to own and that they're good investments and they make money. Now they don't make money anymore. What do you think these other banks and investors are, are doing? Okay. It's not something that's profitable to hold. Do you think they're going to continue to invest in treasuries? No, they're not. I wouldn't. Right? If you knew that you were going to buy a, a, an investment and it was going to be a negative rate of return, would you buy the investment? Is what it comes down to. All right. And, and so the answer for me is no, I'm not going to buy that investment. And it, it makes me lose money on a regular basis. Now, the problem with the treasury is that a treasury is a debt note, meaning it's going to have a continuous yield. What was agreed upon on the interest rate is what it's going to be, just like on a mortgage. right? If you buy a mortgage or, or a bank gives you a mortgage, you have to pay whatever interest rate the bank agrees with. And if you don't pay that rate, you don't get to keep the mortgage. right? So the good news is there's a lot of stability. The bad news is that if that rate's negative, it's going to continue to be negative. It's not going to go up. It's not going to be different all of a sudden. And so what's happening with these banks is they're deciding, hey, we don't want treasuries anymore. 
we don't want to hold the United States dollar. So you can look at international central banks, international banks that are basically used to invest in our treasuries and, and hold them. They don't like them anymore. They're getting rid of them, actually. Now, that might not sound like a big deal, but what that means is the dollar is losing confidence. The United States dollar is not looked at as an asset anymore. It's being looked at as a liability. Now, the other issue here is that the central banks, when they're printing out this money and they're, they're loaning it to the United States Treasury, they have a balance sheet just like we do, right? So the central bank, the Federal Reserve Bank, one and the same thing, they have assets and they have liabilities, okay? When they create currency, that's a liability. It goes on their, their liability sheet. When they create currency, that means that they're borrowing money into an existence is literally just a credit line that they're pulling out of nowhere and loaning that to the United States government. That's a liability for the, for the United States Federal Reserve Bank, but they're usually, they're usually like loaning that out for a treasury. They're getting an asset in return. So their balance sheet and assets is growing. If you actually look in 2008, in 2008, oh, I think I got Facebook up and running again. In 2008, um, the amount of, of, of assets that the Federal Reserve Bank had is 10 times more today. Meaning that when they buy the debt, when they get oh, Facebook's back up and running, when they buy debt uh, from the United States government, they typically right now own 10 times more than they did in 2008. Isn't that crazy? 10 times more. That literally means that there's a bank that's getting wealthy, 10 times more wealthy in the last, uh, what is that, 12 years? right? Just off of loaning money to our government. And that's again, backed by future taxation. Okay. So I want to go back to my whiteboard. Let me get this back up and proper for you guys. All right. Let me flip Instagram around. Thank you guys for, for hanging out with me again tonight. So again, we used to have a U.S. treasury with a positive yield. It used to be a positive return. And now it's not. Okay. Now it's a negative return. It used to be a profitable investment. Now it costs, <clears throat> right? So if I used to own these, right? I used to own these because they were positive. Now I don't because they're negative. What's happening is these central banks are exchanging it for gold. Okay. So a little bit of history for you guys. In 1970, our currency prior to 1970 used to be backed by gold. Okay. The dollar used to be backed by gold, and we actually had some accountability. If, if fake money was made, we could look at that as citizens and be like, hey, that doesn't work because that's, that's, de that's devaluing the amount of gold we have per the dollar. The ratios don't work. After 1970, the dollar was no longer backed by gold. Okay, so we're going to say from 1971 onward, the dollar was no longer backed by gold. So now there's no gold. Okay, and, and basically we were just like sending people paper and they would send us, you know, goods and services from their country. And so today, 2020, central banks own more gold than they did back in 1971. Okay, this is astronomical. This means that, that like federally, like our country is doing so poorly that a countries across the nation are saying, nope, we want back, we want to go back to gold. We want gold. We don't want the US dollar anymore. They're getting rid of it in droves and they're buying up gold. They haven't bought up this much gold since 1971, which was literally the year we got off gold. So they would have had the most gold ever at that point in time because they had accumulated it. And then we switched, they started getting rid of it. And we're saying basically, here's what the graph would look like, right? It went from here down and now it's back up again. Right, so this is 1971, this is 2020. So we went from gold down here to really no gold. And now central banks want gold again. Now down here, we had the US treasury. When there was no gold, we had the treasury and the treasury was looked at as an asset. Back here, the treasury didn't exist. Here, the treasury does exist, but nobody wants it. Countries are not looking at buying something that's going to cost them money. It doesn't make any sense, right? And, and so that's really like when you, when you look at the, the economy, right now it looks like stocks are up, 
right? They're starting to recover. It looks like things are going to be better. But what I'm telling you is, no, it's not because our country is losing credibility. Our currency is losing trust globally. Other countries are saying, we don't want to deal with your currency anymore. It's looked at as a liability, right? And so what that means for us as citizens is if we're saving in dollars, if we're saving in dollars, that means that we're not going to have our buying power. Damn, Facebook shut me down again. All right, let me let me get this back up and running. So what that means is if we're US citizens that are basically we're we're losing our buying power. And our buying power is going down every single time money is printed by the Federal Reserve. Our buying power is being reduced. And so what that means is if we're saving, we're not making money, we're losing value. And, and, and that's really big because in an environment like this, there's two things that are going to happen. Right now, like I mentioned, the Fed is bailing us out, um, printing out all this money. The economy looks like it's doing awesome. Everything looks like it's going to be back to normal. And there's this hope. But what's going to happen is, is when you print out money at that rate, I got people texting me. Let me know Facebook shut us down. We're going to get back up and running on Facebook. When you print out money at this rate, um, it devalues the currency. Currency meaning dollars. When dollars go down in value, it takes more and more dollars to buy the same things. Okay, so who can remember when a house costed, you know, maybe 50 grand, right? I Personally, I wasn't old enough for that, right? But I remember when it was maybe 100,000. I know my parents could buy a house for 50 grand. They could buy a car for maybe five grand. Uh, I do remember when gas was like 89 cents a gallon, right? And all right, so we're going to try this on Facebook with no title and no description and see what happens. Let's see if this works. I think Facebook is, is shutting down my stuff because it's, it's true. <laughs> it's not something that's pretty to hear, but it's true. Um, but basically what we're talking about here is the... Oh yeah, we're back up and running. Okay, so basically what we're talking about is the currency goes down in value. It takes more money to buy the same things. We have to continue trading time for money. We're making the same money or less money and we're able to buy less and less stuff. That's the devaluation of currency. That is the result of federal governments borrowing money from central banks. Did you know prior to 1913, there was no, there was no such thing as a central bank? Okay, who, can, who, knows, who knows Andrew Jackson, President Andrew Jackson? A lot of people hate on him, okay? Not the most popular guy, but Andrew Jackson dedicated his life to pre preventing central banks from entering America. If you look in, in the European history, you'll see that when, when there were wars, it was because central banks were involved financing the wars. In World War II, J.P. Morgan, the company, literally financed Germany they, they loaned money to freaking the Nazis. This is an American company loaned money to the Nazis, right? Like th these are not good guys we're talking about. They're not doing like moral things. They're doing terrible things. So we're saying prior to 1913, there were no central banks. Prior to 1913, there was also no income tax, okay? Because we just said the central bank loans money to the United States government. That money by the, you know, basically borrowed by the government gets paid by our citizens and our tax money. Now, if it's going to be guaranteed, there has to be a collection agency, thus enters the IRS, right? This whole thing started back in 1913. You should care. OMG, it's Nate. You definitely should care about this. This is not just your economic future. This is literally your freedom. Like if you want freedom, you need to be in, like, in the know about this stuff, right? So what happens is when governments print out currency like this, it devalues our dollar. Like I mentioned, it takes more and more money to buy the same things. We still have to trade time for money. Our taxes go up because the money borrowed is being paid with our tax revenue that the government collects. Who here doesn't like low, high taxes? I don't. Okay, I want to see some hearts and likes if you don't like high taxes. I can't stand taxes. I try and pay zero if I can, right? So anytime our government borrows money, it's guaranteeing future taxation. That, that disturbs me on a high level because I don't have a decision in that. I don't get to vote on that. I don't get to pick, right? I get stolen from. At the end of the day, I firmly believe taxation is theft, right? 
And so, so if I don't like taxes, then I shouldn't like the, the, the idea that all of this money, even if I can get some of it, if I didn't take any SBA loans because I looked at that and I was like, I can't, like, they would literally be shooting myself in the foot. I'm going to borrow money that's cheap and then my taxes are going to go up because everyone is doing this. So I'm probably the only guy out there saying, hey, don't take the SBA loans, right? Like, like the taxation goes up and, and basically economically speaking, there's two things that I think are going to happen. Okay, the first one is called hyperinflation. Okay, and I'm going to go back to this, this whiteboard. Let me flip you guys back around. Hopefully Facebook doesn't shut us down again on this one. So there's two things that happen. The first thing that happens is called hyperinflation. Okay, so we have hyperinflation. Hyperinflation. All right, so we just talked about if we print more dollars, the dollars become worth less, and then it takes more and more money to buy the same thing. So what does that say about values of, let's say, stocks? Okay, stocks are gonna go up. Not because they're more valuable, because it takes more dollars to buy the same stocks. What about real estate? Okay, real estate is gonna go up. Not because it's more valuable, but because it takes more of the same dollars to buy the real estate. Oh, I think they just shut me down again. Yep, they did, it's the whiteboard. Let me flip this, this around. <laughs> All right. So Facebook keeps shutting me down with the whiteboard. So not because like the values of these things don't go up, it takes more dollars to buy these things. So when you print more and more and more and more and more, it basically gets astronomical. Like I'm in LA right now, I don't live here, but in LA, the cost of living is freaking ridiculous. Like to buy a home, it's a million dollars, right? In Alaska where I live, yeah, Facebook has shut me down on the streams here. In Alaska, where I live, like you spend a million dollars on a house, it's gonna be like a mansion. LA, you spend a million dollars on a house, you're lucky that you get a condo. That's basically it, right? Not because homes in LA are worth more or they're more valuable, it's simply because the dollar doesn't go as far here, right? So what happens in a hyperinflation environment is asset prices spike, so home values will skyrocket, the stock market will skyrocket, gold and silver prices will skyrocket, Grocery prices will skyrocket. Everything will cost more because the dollar doesn't buy as much and it takes more of those dollars to buy the same things. Now, as an investor, we're looking at this and it's like, man, this might actually look good. But what I'm saying is as a consumer, as a consumer, I don't like that. Okay, that means that when I go buy bread, it's $8 instead of $3. That means when I buy gas, it's $10 instead of $3.89 or whatever it costs right now, right? That's not a good thing. And what ends up happening is our wages don't follow that increase. We don't make more money just because things went up. We still make pretty much the same money, but it costs more to buy everything. So there's this thing called hyperinflation where everything shoots up in value and shoots up in price and it just gets out of control. Right? And, and so what happens is consumers, they can't spend and, and live like they used to. So they start hoarding. They start pulling back. Right? You've seen it when you go to a car dealership and the sticker price on the window is higher than you thought it would be. Do you stay in the dealership or do you leave? You usually leave, right? I'm going to leave the dealership. I'm going to say, hey, I can't afford this vehicle. I'm not spending my money here. The same thing happens in a country when the dollar value goes down so much that everything costs more. Basically, we can't, we can't buy the same, the same uh, groceries, gas, rent, home costs, etc., because that hyperinflation kicked in. So everyone pulls back, and then what happens is next is called deflation. Okay, deflation. So I'm gonna just simplify this. Inflation is basically when there's a lot of money, but there aren't a lot of goods and services, right? There's tons of money out there, there's not a lot of goods and services. So the value of those goods and services goes up simply because it costs more, right? And deflation is when there's tons of goods and services, there's not enough money. Right, they're inverse, they're opposite. So what I'm saying is we're flooding the economy with money. Two trillion dollars right now is what's on the table. That is a lot of money. We're flooding the economy with money and we have not enough goods and services. Right now we don't even have enough workers, let alone goods and services. That's the other problem right now is people are not working, right? Um, work drives goods and, goods and services. You have to have employees to run these companies and to produce. And if you don't, it's very hard to do anything. 
Okay, so right now we're flooding the economy with money. We don't have the goods and services. The buying demand is not there. The employment is not there. All of these things that make an economy click are not there, but a bunch of money is. So it's going to start to dry up. When you push and push and push dollars out like that, things start to crash, right? And so deflation is the other half of this. Deflation means that we have a ton of goods and services. We don't have enough money now. Okay, because everything goes up in price, the consumer starts to run dry. They don't have money saved anymore. They don't have the income, that, that the buying power, all the things that they're used to. And so they stop spending. Now, if you just think about this, logically speaking, if everyone stops spending, which is actually what our country is trying to defend against right now, with this whole coronavirus thing, if people are at home and not working, spending halts, right? So that's the big reason why they're pushing money into the economy. But let's say in an environment where no one's spending money, that means that businesses have to lower their prices. They have to try and entice people to go buy, right? They have to basically do bargains, discounts, sales. If you look back at the Great Depression, right? That's, that's a very good example of, of this type of environment. And so they have to try and make people come out and buy by reducing their prices. Now, what happens if a business reduces its prices enough? Again, logically speaking, if I reduce my prices, I can't afford to keep my employees on staff. I would have to fire people and lay them off, right? So prices go down, the workforce starts to shrink, people stop spending money and the economy just dries up. Okay, those are the two things I believe are going, are going to happen as a result of this. I think we're back up on, <laughs> we're back up on Facebook again. We're not gonna do the whiteboard anymore. That's, that's what's causing them to shut this down. Um, so basically we're looking at hyperinflation, dollars are flooding into the economy, driving up values and it's going to look good like it's going to look like the stock market recovered it's going to look like real estate is ripping it's going to look like everything is on track but it's also going to look expensive like i mentioned like these are the indicators we've got to be looking for right so the market starts going up all these assets go up but so do my bills so do my my monthly costs my budgetary items right and so then the second thing i mentioned is deflation meaning that people are not going to be able to spend what they used to the economy will start to contract businesses will have to lower prices employees would get laid off at that point and the economy starts to dry up so these are the two things i'm looking at right now though currently we were just on the verge of deflation like a month ago right like the coronavirus hit people got basically unemployed unemployment by the way is is higher than it was currently than it was in the great depression that's what I'm saying is the severity of the situation. People aren't looking at it and confronting it. They're, they're, they're focused on freaking the Tiger King and all this other stuff that's out there. But unemployment right now in the United States is worse than it was in the Great Depression. And sure, it's momentary, but at the end of the day, how long is this, this stay-at-home thing going to last? And if it lasts two months, it's a real question. Do you have a job? Does the company you work for stay in business if it can't have its doors open for the next two months? Right. So what I'm saying right now, these are the issues at hand. We have to be focused on education and production. Okay. Education and production. I need to understand money. What I just explained to you with money, this is literally advanced economics. I explained it to you at about a fifth grade level because that's how it should be explained. It should be very simple, very easy to track with because it's not complicated stuff. Right. So we need to understand money, financial education, real financial education has never been more important. Never been more important. Finances are how we get our rights given to us or taken away, right? Like when we look at, at all of this debt, like I said, that's future taxation, that's finances. If I don't understand finances, I can't see that and realize my rights are being stripped right now. For SBA loans, like, like that's, it's not even worth, like, if, if, if a business can't make it for two months or a, a month right now, they probably shouldn't have been in business. Like you should, as a, and that, that's not a mean thing. I'm a business owner. I keep six months in reserves. Because of that, I need to be able to say my business is actually strong enough to stay in business if a small little dip happens. We shouldn't have freaking you know, United saying we have to lay off 60% of our staff because we've been closed for three weeks. So the state of the economy is not good and people are not confronting that. We're looking at all of these distractions and really trying to make it seem better than it really is and seem more significant and, and, and have the silver lining. But the reality is, is right now we have higher unemployment, 
the market is freaking tanked. It's not worth anything. It's being propped up by stimulus money. We're being bailed out. Taxes are going to go up. Buying power is going to go down. We have people that aren't paying rent. We have people that are late on their mortgages, which by the way, the mortgage thing is crazy. In six to 12 months, when all of this clears and nobody has been paying their mortgage, it's not going to be forgiven. Like people are going to lose homes over that. That's, that's going to either lose home or I'm going to extend my loan. Those are my only two options right now. Okay. So the bottom line is the things that are hurting me right now, if I'm saying I can't pay my mortgage, if I'm saying I can't pay rent or I'm saying I lost my income, those are the things I need to be fixing. Well, I'm laid up at home. I should not be watching Netflix and binge binging on Facebook and Instagram. I should be focusing on how do I make sure that I'm bulletproof? Because right now, if, if I'm, if I'm hurting like that, I wasn't, I wasn't in a good position. If a, if a month of no work caused me to make basically not be able to pay any of my bills, I was financially illiterate and irresponsible all the way leading up to that. Facebook ended my stream again. Um, and, and so I have to really take responsibility for where I'm at in that position. If that's me, I can't like not confront it. I can't act like nothing is happening. I need to really look at, man, I, I was the reason this happened because the bottom line is that not everyone is in that position. So what do we do looking forward? That's really what I want to focus on for this last part tonight. Okay. Looking forward, how do we handle this? How do we actually make this thing work? And, and, and what I'm saying is that things for a little small period, maybe it's a couple months, maybe it's a year will look like they got better. It's going to appear like things improved. And a lot of us right now that are, are relaxing and we're acting like nothing really happened. Um, let me try going live just on, on regular. Air is starting broadcast. Yeah, they won't even let me put the broadcast up now. That's insane. Filtration at its finest, right? So those of us that are acting like things are already improving and, and that we can relax and that the government's going to bail us out, what I'm saying is for the next six to 12 months, it's going to appear that things are improving. And after that, it's going to crash and it's going to be worse. Because all of this like unpaid money, this debt, like it, it doesn't just go away. Debt has to be paid. If I'm, if I'm missing six months worth of mortgage payments, that has to be paid at some point. It's not going to just be like, oh, we're fine. I'm back to work. The world is going to be normal. Like all of the things that I didn't do during this period, the things that I left undone, the things that I didn't finish, things that I did halfway, all of that stuff is going to add up and it's going to bite me. All right, let's see if Facebook will go up again. So here's, here's what I need to be doing. I need to, I need to be focusing on money and educating myself on how the economy works. Things that I need to be looking at is how do supply and demand work? Okay. How do inflation and deflation work? Okay. I need to be studying like where, where does the federal reserve bank play into our United States government? Okay. And, and how does that system work? And this is all avail available information. Anybody could be watching and studying this stuff. I need to have a very good understanding of that. I need to know how does manipulation happen in the stock market, right? This recent crash, it wasn't an accident. Okay, this, this is actually like dealing with stuff that we didn't deal with in 2008. In reality, like we printed money for probably three or four years after 2008 to prop things up and make it seem like the economy was doing better than it was. And so we're just now dealing with all of that because it didn't fix itself. We, we basically, we, we put band-aids on it. We hoped it would get better. And it looked like it did and it lasted for about a decade and it was a good run. And now the stack of cards we built up is coming down again. That's the reality of the situation. So this, this is basically like the bubble got inflated, inflated, inflated. Coronavirus was just the needle. Okay, it was, it was just the thing that popped the bubble. It wasn't the thing that created it or the thing that caused it. It was just the incident that popped the bubble. And because of that, we should probably fix the thing that blew the bubble up, not the thing that popped it. I'm not saying don't fix the virus. Obviously, do fix the virus. But I'm saying if we do that and nothing else, we're going to end up in the same position in 12 months. And the thing that caused the bubble is the government printing out money that it doesn't actually have and causing inflation of asset values. Right? It's this game they play. They think they can manipulate and bring currency values down and asset values up and then manipulate it back down and keep it level. But the reality is, is that's a type economically that's a tight tight rope it's not a good thing it's not safe it's never successfully been done every every civilization that's ever done what our government is doing right now has ended 
it's a hundred percent fail rate. You can look back in history, every single civilization that devalued their currency, even back when it was gold and they started alloying copper and different stuff into the gold, the currencies crashed. That's the same thing we're doing today. All of them have crashed. It's not going to be different if we keep on doing the same thing. So if I'm looking at this, I need to be very educated on this stuff. And, and education is not, you know, knowing what diversification is on my mutual fund portfolio or what type of life insurance I should buy or the rule of 72 or any of this little pony show hat trick financial information that gets touted by salespeople. Education is understanding the stuff that I'm talking about tonight. Okay, as, as an economic advisor, as a wealth coach, if I don't know this information, I'm not valuable to you. I can't help you. So I know this information first. I'm saying you need to know this information first too. That's the first step. The second step after you're educated is we all need to go start creating our income. Okay, I know it's, it's only essential businesses can stay open, but if you're online, there's no reason you can't make money right now. Like figure it out. Like literally, if I was unemployed, Anchorage, the town I'm from, they have a grocery store called Cars. Cars is hiring thousands of people. Sure, it's nine bucks an hour, but guess what? Nine bucks an hour is better than no bucks an hour. If I had to, I would go work at Cars. I would go get anything I had to right now to get my income up. I would be online. If I wasn't an essential business, I would figure out how to become one. I have a client in Anchorage. He has an auto shop. Okay. And, and basically what's happening in the auto shop is they can't do their detailing work and their, their auto starts and their normal customized stuff because people aren't bringing vehicles in. So they figured out how to make medical masks. And they're, they're, they're supplying hospitals and stuff with those medical masks. That's a way to figure out how to become essential. But if I just shut my business down, I'm like, oh, oh I'm not essential. I guess I can't be in business and I have to go broke and I'll just take some SBA loans and try and like, I actually did that to myself if that's my attitude. So I need to be like, make money no matter what. If it's legal and ethical, I'm doing it. If that means I go work a $9 an hour job, I'm gonna go work a $9 an hour job. If that means that I go from being an, a car customization shop to making plastic medical max, masks, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. If that means that I go from, oh, Facebook just shut me down again. Um, if you, <laughs> it's like six times tonight, this is getting ridiculous. Little do they know I'm probably the most persistent person on earth. So I'm going to keep popping it back up again because I want people to see this message. But, you know, that means that I'm an accountant and I don't like people, but I can't do accounting right now. Shit, I'm going to go be sales. I'm going to go figure out how to drive revenue and bring in money right now. Right? Like my wife, Lexi, was saying, hey, you should focus on like creative ways to earn income. And I, I, I intentionally didn't because I said, no, if somebody wants to earn income, they don't need help being creative. Okay, someone that's lazy, they need to be probed along and encouraged and, and, and really they just don't want it. There's nothing I can say to that person if they're not right now feeling urgency. Like that's just crazy to me. But somebody that does feel the urgency, they don't need to be pushed along and prodded to go earn more income. That should just be naturally there. Like I'm in a dangerous situation. I'm going to go make more money. That's the result. Those are the, the two first things I'd be doing. Get a good financial education. Again, understanding inflation, deflation, GDP, the U.S. Treasury the Federal Reserve Bank, interest rates, the markets, all of that stuff I should understand because it's all correlated and it's all manipulated. Like it's all 100% manipulated. I need to know that stuff. Then I'm going into income mode. Make money no matter what. If that means that I'm donating blood, if that means that I'm, I'm helping out at the hospital, whatever I've got to do to make money right now, I would be doing it. Okay. And then secondarily, I'm saving like crazy. Okay. Who's, who's heard like the last you know, probably five, 10 years, the whole cash is trash message. There's, there's a degree of truth to that. Like we just said, if, if currency is going down in value because we're pushing and pushing money out in the system, like there's a degree of truth to that, but also cash is leverage in a time like this. So I'm going to save. Savers are not losers right now. Savers are those who are, who are going to survive this thing. Those that have money to keep afloat, and have money to take advantage of opportunities are those that are going to be okay at the end of this thing. Those that are paycheck to paycheck, quite frankly, they're going to get run over. Okay. Now, the other thing too is if I'm an entrepreneur, I need to be okay being an employee right now. If I'm in business as a business owner and my business is failing, it means that I'm not successful as a business owner. I know that hurts to think about, and I've been there before. It really stings. but 
it's a sobering thought that we all have to have. If I'm an entrepreneur and I just had to take an SBA loan, I would probably make a freaking killer executive at a com company that didn't go under right now. Right, the solo entrepreneur that's barely getting by right now because they kill it when times are good and they don't have the strength when times are bad, that's the perfect employee. That's the guy everyone wants in their company. That's the guy who gets treated like an exec executive and is able to work their way up. The employment market is gonna be, a market is gonna become open. Okay, and we can't all go start businesses. At the end of the day, like, again, if, 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 if we go into a deflationary environment, it means that there's a ton of products and services and not enough money. So I need to go figure out who's collecting the money and I need to go and get in with them because that's where they're winning at. I can go attach to that revenue stream instead of going and trying to start my own. Okay, those are literally the three things I'd be thinking about right now. I wouldn't watch freaking Tiger King or I, like, like just right now, if you have 12 hours, 20 hours a day of just studying, probably not 20 unless you're, you're sleeping four hours, let's say 12 to 16 hours a day, I would be studying like crazy. I would be working like crazy. I'd be adding value like crazy. I would be pushing my income up. I would be saving more money than I ever have before. And that's all I would do. And if I did just those things, I'd be fine. I would stay out of the stock market. Okay, I would not buy a house right now. It's probably the worst time to buy a house because housing is going to come down. When this, when this thing finally does hit, what I'm saying is it's going to bounce and it's going to feel good for the next six to 12 months. Then it'll hit. When that happens, like, like the housing values are going to come down to the bottom of the bubble. Right? So, so if things crash and let's say a $300,000 house goes down to 100000 that means that house was really only worth 100000 the entire time. But it was in a bubble. It was inflated. It's not going to pop back up at that point. It's going to maybe inflation adjust increase bit by bit. So I wouldn't go buy a house right now. I wouldn't get in the stock market. Like all of these things are going to bounce and then they're going to pop. And if I get into them because I think they're going to bounce, and I'm like, yeah, I can put money back in now. Like I'm going to lose that in 12 to 18 months. Okay. So very critical to understand this and very critical to pay attention right now and actually be on top of this thing because like, this is make or break. And, and this, these are the times, quite, quite frankly, where the wealthy build more wealth. Like there are people that are succeeding right now. There are people that are winning financially right now. And it's because that they were preparing for this the last 10 years. When everyone else was getting car loans and mortgages and going on vacations and all of this stuff, these people were actually stacking cash. They were staying out. I was one of them. I didn't buy a house. I've never owned a house. I probably never will. Facebook just went down once again. Um, probably going to leave it, leave it down because we're about to wrap up here. I never, I've never bought a house. I never will. I haven't had money in the stock market since, shoot, 2014 or 15 because I've known this information, right? Instead, I've put money in myself. I've put money in my business. I've put money into real estate. I've put money into gold and silver. I've put money into private loan deals that I'm lending money out to other people and having it secured by their assets. Like that's the stuff I've been focused on. And if you've got cash right now, that's the stuff you should be focused on too. Okay. So guys, I want to wrap this up really quick. If there's any questions, I want to go ahead and answer those. Let me just scroll through our comments. Awesome. I love that everyone was on here tonight. I really appreciate you guys. Um, Jordan, good to see you guys. If you made it on here from Facebook, I appreciate it. Facebook was being freaking ridiculous tonight. It's amazing how filtered that is. Um, I don't see any, any comments here. I hope Nate figures it out. <laughs> awesome. I don't see any, any major comments here on Instagram. Um, I appreciate you all. By the way, we just got these shirts, and I don't know if anyone noticed, we officially have Wealth Dynamics t-shirts. Let me show our, our Zoom here. We officially have Wealth Dynamics t-shirts. If you guys would like a Wealth Dynamics t-shirt, um, those are for sale. You can DM me. I'd love to get one out to you. I appreciate you all. Jordan, good to see you. Brad, good to see you. Carter, great. Thank, thank you for being on. Uh, Jorge, good to see you. Um, anyways, if you guys have any questions, hit me up in the DM. Richie, great to see you. Um, if you guys have any questions, hit me up in the DMs throughout this week. Uh, hopefully next week we have an easier time with Facebook, but I appreciate you all. Make sure you share this. Um, follow me for more content this week. If you guys need help really quick, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up on this note. If you guys need help with finances right now, we do a plan called a, bl a blueprint. 
Okay, it's a blueprint. We literally build your financial plan. We sit down with you virtually right now, one-on-one. -on -one. Jordan's done one. Uh, I know Jorge is about to do one. Brad has done one. It's an incredible plan we do for people. We don't charge for that. So if you're watching this right now and you're like, hey, I actually need some serious help with my finances. You know, maybe I'm trying to get things organized or maybe I'm trying to, you know, move my investments out of the market into a better position. We don't charge like money for a blueprint. We do that for free on a referral basis. Okay, so we'll do three referrals. We'll get you out of debt completely on a blueprint with three referrals. If you want us to help with investments, we'll do five referrals. If you would like access to our app for the blueprint, so we'll build it for you and you'll have access to the back end of it to update it at any time you need to, that's a 10 referral plan. Okay, so we'll build that to you at no cost. If you're interested in getting a blueprint done, um, reach out to me in the DMs. If you're interested in a shirt, reach out as well. If you just have general questions, reach out. Have a great Friday night. Um, stay off that Tiger King and I'll talk to you guys soon.